ideas as we're as we're looking at this. So we're gonna read we're gonna read a chunk of, of, of verses this morning. Is that all right? Sweet. Story time. Um all right, first Corinthians chapter twelve. We're gonna start in verse twelve and, and actually read read through most of this right here. So it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You know, it feels like Kamala Harris wrote that. You know what I'm saying? Was, is that appropriate or inappropriate? Did I? Get that? I'm like, I don't care who you vote for. But we gotta agree. There's some speechwriters that need some help. I'm just, just saying. I'm just saying. It, it, no reference to sides in any way. It's just the speechwriting. I'm sorry. <laughs> what am I doing? What about you guys messed me up. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. You guys. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is one member, but many. All right, you guys catching this? I love this. That like it doesn't matter, slave, free, Jews, Greek, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. When you come into relationship with Jesus, you are brought into one body. And it doesn't mean that you lose identity. It doesn't mean you give up who you are in the context of culture or, or perspective or ideas. It's actually the fact that that is a unique expression, that diversity coming together is actually what brings the fullness to the body. And it's a really beautiful picture, and it's something that, like, um, it, uh, People have mistaken unity for conformity, and that's not what unity is. Unity is something significantly deeper, where there's actually beauty and love found in the unique expressions of how and who God has made each one of us. And what's powerful about that is that we can, when you begin to really get into this, we're, we're going to kind of do a kind of a shallower teaching this morning, if that's okay, just for the sake of time. But this is like the root of when we talk about uh, honor and agreement are not the same thing. Like, I can honor someone and not necessarily agree with everything they have to say or agree with every point or premise that they're, you know, teaching or, or does, does, are you guys tracking with me? Yeah. Great. Okay, good. We're all on, the, all on the same team together this morning. This is awesome. All right. Verse 15. I love this. I want to read this just because I think it's hilarious that this is actually in the Bible. Um, this is just a passage for me since I was a young person that I'm just like, what was, like, if this was inspired by God, I just want to be like Paul's, like, writing. He's like, Ooh, I got this really cool illustration we're going to use. And the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, say this. He's like, ha, ha, and we're going we're gonna to get there in a second. Remember, I was a youth pastor for many years. <laughs> okay, so I'm just saying. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? So if we all looked the same, talked the same, acted the same, where would the body be? There wouldn't be a body. We'd be a bunch of iRobots. You know what I'm saying? I love the fact that it's actually rooted in the way God has made us and designed us. It's according to his pleasure. The picture that I get is like, I don't know if you've ever played with like kids making Play-Doh creations. Anybody? whether they were yours or a nephew or a little brother or sister or something like that, and to watch them get so excited for this lump of nothingness, really. I mean, you know what I'm saying? No? Just me? Am I the only one that I'm like, that is such a beautiful thing. What is that? And they're like, what do you mean, what is that? I made a snake. I'm like, oh, good. I'm glad I didn't say what I thought it was because that would just be terrible. Yes, guys? Thank you. All right. It's, but you see the pleasure in creating. There's this, there's this unique joy in forming and fashioning something in its uniqueness. There's, there's something about the Father's heart that is found, that he finds pleasure in the uniqueness of what he's made. Are you tracking with me? And I think what's important for us to remember is oftentimes we get really stirred, and, stirred up and caught up in uh, like this, this frustration we feel that we don't look or sound like someone else. 
we don't dress the same, or maybe we're, we're struggling in a conversation. Sometimes it's actually, and typically it's rooted in areas where you believe you're inadequate. The problem is that to a creator, their creation, when it's complete, is not inadequate in any form. Are you understanding me? From your perspective, you may feel areas of inadequacy. From God's perspective, he sees a beautiful, whole creature that he formed and fashioned with purpose and destiny and identity. And what's profound about that is that if you lose sight of that, you'll find yourself in circumstances and situations that God has placed you in wishing it was someone else that was there or wishing you were someone else to handle the task in front of you. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? God has placed you in unique places with unique relationships, and he's formed and fashioned you in a way that will fully meet the call that is resting on your life in those moments. And to, to say anyone else could do a better job is to miss the uniqueness that God has created you with. There's not a better person that could be having that conversation in a coffee shop in that moment. You're sitting there, and the person that this has happened, I, the, 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 well, I can't say the number of times because it's happened a handful of times, not like an astronomical number. I was about to say, and I realized, like, yeah, it's a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> this happened several times, though. It happened this week, actually, where I got a text message from someone, and they're like, I need to know, like, what's the center push? How do I lead someone, you know, to the Lord? And it's like, actually, and, and, and it used to be when I was working with youth leaders, is like I'd get text messages of, like, panic where they're in it, they're hanging out with a teenager, and the teenager's asking, how do, I, how do I serve Jesus? How do I know? Like, what does it mean to be a Christian? And they're like, I wish you were here, Dustin. I wish you could talk to this person. You would have the right things to say. And it's actually, no, I wouldn't have the right things to say. God placed you in that place at that time. You. He put you there. He didn't put me there. He put you there because he trusts you to handle it. He trusts the uniqueness of who you are, that you actually are carrying what's needed in that moment, in that situation. Are you tracking? Okay, good. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 20, now indeed there are many members in yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. You know, I'm, I'm listening to this audiobook about medical stuff right now, and there's a, a, a chunk where it talked about there was unnecessary uh, tonsillectomies. Is that right? Where they remove your tonsils, okay? In like the 40s and 50s, unnecessarily, and it caused massive outbreaks of polio and, uh, and other diseases because, of the, because it was an unnecessary medical procedure, and just like, yeah, it's, like, it's unnecessary. We don't, we don't need the tonsils. Let's get rid of it. It might make you sick a little bit later. And so then they were electing to do this, and it caused, like, massive outbreaks. Really, really crazy. It's this stuff. Things that seem to be weaker seem to be unnecessary. It's usually because they have yet to be discovered the purpose. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's the context that purpose has yet to be discovered, that your appendix. These, there's, like, these terms. I forget the term. I, I really wish I could remember it, there's like body parts, like organs that you have in your body that seem to be unnecessary, like hung over from previous evolutionary <laughs> versions of yourself. That's typically what's explained, right? But every single one of them, it's just because the uniqueness of their purpose hasn't been discovered. And there's always problems when they get removed. There's always a trickle-down effect because all of a sudden now there's something that is missing from your body that needs to be there. It has a form. It has a function. It has a purpose. Are you tracking? Okay. All right. And those members of the body which seem to, uh, those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and, our, and on our unrepresentable parts have greater modesty. It's interesting. It really does speak to the context of, of like the care and the cover that's, that's needed and necessary over, over, over things that we value. It's really, it's a, it's a powerful, again, we don't have time this morning. We've got to get to our second passage, all right? Uh, but our, our presentable parts have no need. <laughs> it's interesting, though, like for yourself, like you don't, you don't view your body in this way. Like you don't think like, oh, man, you know, my knees are not that necessary. Do you know what I'm saying? 
Like, I got a good set of elbows. I'm good. I don't need my knees. Anybody? No? No, no one. No one's like, I don't need this part of my thigh. You know, I never think about this portion until you're doing a squat and you pull that muscle and then you're like, dear Lord, what happened? <laughs> yes? I never think, how, how many of you guys ever really take conscious thought about your pinkies? No, until this last week when it gets caught in a gi and almost broken. Then you think about it every day. You go to shake some, this morning I went to shake some hands and I'm just like, dear Lord, please don't squeeze hard. I just like <laughs> smile and like, yeah. I mean, it's, it, the swelling has come down considerably, but you should have seen it. This week it was like, it was gnarly, right? You never think about it until all of a sudden it's hurting. There's a problem there. Presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body having given greater honor to the part which lacks it. That's a whole, a whole thing. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. The same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer. I'm going to tell you, my whole body suffered when my pinky was hurting. Yes? Anybody kick a coffee table, walk in the middle of the night, you know, a little, little baby toe? Can I tell you something gnarly that happened? <laughs> Not to me, but I was there. This was uh, about a, a couple months ago. We were training, right? Again, jujitsu story. Sorry, guys. We were training, and a person's foot got caught in the mat, and then he twisted, and it dislocated his pinky. And so he's sitting there, and his pinky, and this is not an exaggeration, was sitting sideways like this. Oh, no. <laughs> and we're all like, <gasps> and there's a guy that, that's there. He's like, I think I can set that. This is like a room full of guys that, like, we practice choking each other and breaking each other's arms. You know what I'm saying? There's, like, there's a level of, like, once someone says that, you, yes, you can't back away. You can't back away from that kind of a statement because the rest of the room is like, okay, let's see. And the, and the guy who's pinky is, like, off to the side is like, I don't want to go to the, I don't wanna go to the doctor. Like, yeah, go for it. Like, let's see if we can fix it now that I don't have to go get it done, you know? And he, the guy legit pulls it and sets it, and it was, it was awesome. And also really disgusting at the same time. Just saying, his whole body felt it. I mean, the rest of us in the room felt it, and we weren't even connected to him. You know what I'm saying? We are different bodies, and we all felt it at the same time. All right? This is important to understand. If one member is honored, then all the members rejoice with it. Are you hearing me? This is really, really powerful, and I love this. This verse 27, it's in the second, it's in this next paragraph, but I, it, I feel like the paragraph was, was missing here. And now you are the body of Christ and members individually. This is really powerful to remember that there is a collective identity and an individual identity. It's not one or the other. We don't sacrifice an individual identity for a corporate weird cultish identity. You know what I'm saying? And at the same time, we don't, we don't give up a corporate identity to be so individualistic. We miss the role that we play that is connected in the body. We are, we are meant to be this collective body. We are meant to be connected in a way that when someone is hurting, we hurt as well. When you hear someone or you see someone have breakthrough or a testimony, the healing, that, that you've been praying for healing and they receive healing, it should cause a sense of rejoicing. Why? Because their breakthrough is your breakthrough. When someone else receives a blessing, you are getting blessed because you are connected. You are in the same body. Are you following? This is, this is powerful because I think what, what ends up happening is a lot of times for, the, uh, you know, if you, if you kind of track history and culture and stuff, there is, a, when you look around the world, there's like a difference between uh, collective identities and individual identities. And, and in the United States, we have a very strong individual identity. Okay, and that's a powerful thing. There's, I don't actually think, people talk about it as like something that's wrong. You know what I mean? Like really talk against it in a way. But there's a really powerful component about understanding your individual identity, the uniqueness of how God's made you, the uniqueness of the call that's sitting on you. But to carry that and forget that the fact that the call of God on my life can't be manifested unless I'm grafted into the body. That the actual success, the actual fulfillment of the call on my, on my life is dependent on me being 
plugged into and connected to the body. You understand? How can we see that? If this illustration carries through, any part of your body that is separated from your body dies. Not only does it die, but it loses its purpose and effectiveness. Yes, right? I think, we, I think we forget that sometimes because we, we want to show up on a, on a Sunday morning. We want to feel good. We want to encounter God's presence, not even like in a, in a just like a entertainment fashion. There's a lot of people that are passionately pursuing God and yet have no concept of the, the connection that they are supposed to have in the body of Christ. Do you understand? Sometimes we, we teach it like, ah, just entertainment culture. You're just showing up like a movie. You know what I mean? Like you just want like a good entertaining service. I mean, there are definitely people that want that. But the problem is, is that, I, like, for me, this happens to me, is I, I have a real strong independent streak. Very strong independent streak. <laughs> oh, man. Don't call me out. Come on. Be nice. Um, no, I, I do. And so what happens is I can fully be engaged in pursuing God and yet forget the fact that I'm actually called into connection with people around me. I can, can sh- I can really show up on a Sunday, worship, engage, preach, serve, do what I can even, like, serve, like, volunteer, and yet still walk away and forget the fact that my life's purpose is intimately connected into how I'm, how I'm connected into the people around me. And what's, what's crazy about that is people will struggle with purpose in their life. They'll actually struggle with meaning. They'll struggle with affirmation. They'll struggle with senses of, like, a, a greater sense of call on their life. Like, why, like, you know, the meaning of life kind of questions. And, and it's usually evidence is they actually don't understand the, the purpose in life is found and discovered in the connections with the people around us. Like, God has actually designed us to find those purposes and meaning in those relationships around us. That, like, I mean, think about it this way. Matt writes a beautiful song, okay? And, and in writing the song... There is purpose to it, right? Just inherently, just in creating something special, there's purpose in creating, isn't there? What is the true beauty, though? What is the true purpose of a creative expression without it being shared with people around you? Do you understand? The the actual purpose is found and manifested in its fullness when it's connected into and in a body or in a group of people, whether they're fans, right, like on like an entertainment side, whether it's your friends and family. It's children, it's, it's so funny. You really watch this manifest in children's lives a lot. Why? Daddy, look at me. Daddy, look at me. How did you? They walk, you have friends come over, and what happens? It's showtime. All of a sudden, your kids are like skilled actors and actresses. You know what I'm saying? Like, Never before, never before have you wanted to write a play, but we have friends over, and now you're wanting to display a play that you have now written, and we're trapped for the next 45 minutes as you sing and dance. <laughs> and we all have to uh, clap and cheer. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love it. I, I, sound, I sound like I don't love it, but I, I do love it. I actually really enjoy it. Um, but uh, are you guys following me? Same thing. Like any, any person that creates or, or takes time to do something and fashion form something what, what are typically they're, they're looking to do? They want to share it. They, they want that expression to be enjoyed among other people. Okay, and, and, and the, the call in your life is very similar to that. Are you, are you following me? All right. <clears throat> All right, let's skip over to Ephesians. Some of you knew I was probably going to go here. It's 1135, guys. Can you give me like five, ten more minutes? Okay, and then we'll, then we'll have a quick break. You guys got to get your kids from Kids Church, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of uh, reconvene here in a minute. I totally was not watching the time. Oh, well, that's so generous. <laughs> Until you're hungry. No, I can't get it. <laughs> uh, awesome. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> a 
Okay, there's some really powerful stuff at the beginning of the chapter, but we're, we're going to have to skip down to verse 7, if that's okay. It says this, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay, this is, this is really powerful. You have grace for your assignment and gifting, not for someone else's. Do I need to say that again? Okay, you have grace for your assignment and gifting, not for someone else's. When I try to be someone else, I will always fall victim to anxiety and, and pressure and that sense of burnout, that sense of not measuring up, and it will sap your strength. It will sap who you are. Why? Because God gave you grace according to the gift he gave you. Do you understand? When I function in the gift that is resting on my life, there is a supernatural empowerment, which is God's grace for me, according to the gift he gave me. This is why, in like, even just this last season, when I step into the, 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 the grace, the gifting that is on my life, people will look at it and say, I don't know how you're doing that. That seems like crazy. I'd be burnt out. I'd be, and it's like, I actually don't feel that at all. Why? Because I'm stepping into the gift that is on my life, and there's a supernatural grace that comes in and empowers that, and I, it flows in, like through me in those moments. And what happens to the body around me? They receive the benefit and the blessing of the gift that is on my life. And their lives are enriched for it. If someone else were to step in and be like, I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to try to take on that thing, or, or I'm going to step into this thing, or I'm going to be like so-and-so. They begin to step out of the gift and the call that's on their life, right? And what will happen is they'll oftentimes, if they're very good at it, they can perform their way into people's belief about that gift and yet still be crushed through burnout. Why? Because there's not a supernatural grace empowering that, that thing. We have a lot of really good performers in, in our culture, not like not KLC culture, but in church culture and stuff. Why? Because uh, oftentimes there's been environments that have that have placed a specific expression on a pedestal. And out of our desire to be affirmed in the significance of our life, we've stepped on a pedestal that we weren't created for. And, and the driving factor is is that what you needed was someone to step into your life and say, you are significant. Your life has meaning and purpose, and it's found in the uniqueness of how God formed and fashioned you. you are you following me? <clears throat> and we, we have to find a way. We have to grow in our ability to celebrate and communicate these things. Are you, are you following me? We have to grow in our ability to recognize that with people around us. All right, here we go. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This is just important just because it's like uh, what Paul's doing. He's referencing another a passage in the, in the Old Testament, just reaffirming the fact that it's clear. God has given gifts to men. He's, he's done that thing. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But he also first descended to lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Again, the, the, the root of authority and calling why this all flows and happens. Verse 11. All right. And he himself gave some, some, not everyone, to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. All right. So who is the work of ministry falling on? Whose shoulders? The saints, not the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. This is really powerful. The primary call of fivefold ministry is the equipping of believers to do the ministry. Okay, this is for some of us. This is like okay, we we get this, we know this. Some of us, this is like a bit of a challenge for our church culture. The job of a pastor is not to pastor people. Do you understand that? People are like, wait, no, it is his job or her job. It's like what's supposed to happen. No, the job of the pastor is to equip saints to be pastors to people around, to shepherd people, to care for the flock around them. It, a pastor steps into a room and there will be a universal, like overarching empowerment in the atmosphere, in, the, in that environment 
Why? Because they're carrying a mantle of pastoring that all of a sudden now believers are stepping into an ability to pastor like they've never been able to pastor before. They will feel this thing come up inside of them that was like, oh my gosh, I love loving on people. I love caring for people. Like, this, is, this was difficult before. I find it easier now. This is something new. This is, what is this, right? Same thing with teaching. The teacher, yes, of course, they need to be able to teach, but the job is that it empowers this passion and ability to, to discover truth in the scripture, to learn how to, how to extract understanding and knowledge from this thing, right? Same thing with the prophet. The main job of a prophet is not prophesying. It's equipping saints to be able to walk in prophetic gifting. Are you, are you following with me? This is powerful because oftentimes we find ourselves in environments where there's really powerful ministries, where there's people that are flowing in incredible gifts, and it, it's somehow like we, 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 we see that happening, and the response is that we sit in our seat and allow them to do something and just receive. And the point is that that momentum is meant to, to draft you in and suck you into momentum that you would really otherwise struggle with, that there's like an actual acceleration in your life. Are you, I mean, evangelism is one of the ones that's like a really easy thing to point to because so many of us struggle with it. And like you'll watch somebody who genuinely carries like evangelism, right? Do you guys know Joe, right? Okay. When he gets up and shares his testimony, what happens inside your heart? I, I want, what, what, are, you, are, you, are you going next Saturday? I got I to gotta go with you. Like, it's like this, this automatic like, response that you actually want to go and participate in something that you are probably not thinking about at all. <laughs> Can we just be honest? Like, like, and that, that is what that fivefold expression begins to release in Karen. Are you tracking? Now, this is important because we're going to get to the the, 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 the clincher here in a minute. All right. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, right? So they, they are expressing the gifts that's on their life, but it's, it's primarily for equipping. The secondarily, it's for edifying the body. And now here's purpose. Till so we all come to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm going to pause there for a second. Oh, we'll just add in verse 14. It says that we, we, not the leaders, but we should no longer be children. Here's what's crazy. I'm going to say something super controversial, and, and some of you guys are going to agree, and a lot of you are probably going to kind of struggle with this. Leaders do not have a higher standard. They don't. I do not have a higher standard than you on my life. Years of bad teaching in this subject have, like, ruined believers' expectations for their own maturity. We all have the same standard, every single one of us. It's that we all come to the measure and the fullness of Christ. That's your standard. Your standard is Christ. My standard is Christ. I might, because of my position, have higher accountability and an expectation for a, a process and maturing that should have already taken place in my life before I stepped into a place of leadership, but our standard is the same. Are you tracking with me? The, 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 when you go and you look at the qualifications of elders and deacons, right, in, in the New Testament, in, in Timothy and in Titus and stuff, right, that is not like this exception that we all get to like have a pass on unless you want to be an elder. Then we can just go and have like multiple wives and just like get be drunk all the time and just like destroy our families and stuff. Like you understand how silly that would be. But you actually live life like that. So many of us live life like that. Oh, like I can kind of get away with this movie. I can get away with this behavior. I can get away with this attitude. Why? Because I'm not really leading anything. I'm not really doing anything. I'm just going to church. It's okay. It's not that big of a deal. Maybe if I start leading a life group, then I'll kind of like, I should probably kind of stop doing this stuff. It's okay. Or they're, they're kind of asking me to maybe volunteer in this area of church. And you're like, all right, I should probably, you know, I should probably cut back the number of drinks I had Saturday night from because I, yeah, I'm going to be helping tomorrow at church. And <laughs> the point, the point is that we are all maturing and growing into an expression of the body of Christ. 
You understand, we have the same standard. When someone looks at you, they should see Christ. Not in perfection. We're not perfect, right? We are growing. We're maturing. There's sanctification. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Like this is, do you understand? Like this is, there is a process involved in this. Okay, but we have the same standard. All right, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. All right, don't have time to go down this road. We're going to move on. But, (laughs) verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things. Speaking the truth in love, not speaking the truth. If you can't speak it in love, keep your mouth shut. Because it will not result in people growing up into the fullness of Christ. Go back, find the love, then speak the truth. Are you hearing me? It's actually really important, you guys. The, the idea, like, listen, guys, when I teach culture of honor, I always teach a culture of healthy confrontation. But healthy confrontation is rooted in the fact that I genuinely have found a place of love for the person I'm confronting. Why? Because the purpose of my confrontation isn't to be right or to correct. It's actually to connect. That the purpose of us having a conversation is to establish connection, is to establish, to reestablish this broken place here that we want to heal, we want to love. Like, it has to be spoken in love. Are you following me? All right. May grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body... All of us joined, this is it, this is where we're going to end right here, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. If you have ever questioned your purpose, if you have ever questioned whether you have something to give, if you have ever questioned there was something more on your life, this verse answers it right there. We will not reach maturity as a body until every member steps in and contributes the thing that they're created to contribute. Every joint supplies. Every, every person in this room has something to bring and to, sh- and to, to sow, to, to engage with. Bringing who it is you are and what you are into this body. Your maturity is connected to this expression right here. All of our maturity is connected to this thing. What every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. You want to know why we're struggling sometimes. It's because people are not doing their share. But it's because they've lost vision that their life has purpose to it. That they actually have something that can contribute. They actually are carrying something that they can give, that they can be a part of. And this is, this is a bigger message than just volunteering on Sunday. Do you understand? But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're sitting in your seat and you're not volunteering... That would be a very simple way to discipline your life into this expression. Do you understand? Like, this is not like strong-arming anybody in this room. I'm just telling you. There's, like, things that are effective and volunteering, finding places to engage on a regular basis, whether it's once a month, whether it's, there's just this component. It brings you into relationship. Your heart, your treasure is where your heart is. There's this, there's this component of actually engaging in this way. Is that Okay. At the same time, I'm going to make a plug for Children's Church volunteers. <laughs> I know. I could really use this to manipulate some volunteers. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to be honest with the fact that the church has done that at times. However, the need is real. We actually do need volunteers in Children's Church. So if you're sitting there wondering, it's you. You have something to contribute. <laughs> okay, Kevin, I wasn't wondering. If you weren't wondering, it's you. It's you. <laughs> oh, man, I love you guys. It's like the funnest thing. I love it. All right. By which every part does its share, causes, causes growth of the body, of the body, growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. When we understand the purpose that we were made with, Whether you actually understand the why of what you're called to or the greater or higher call, understanding fundamentally that you have purpose. Do you understand? Sometimes we get lost in the, well, okay, I got to go figure out what my life is called to do. 
and you're like this incredible mom, you're raising kids, you're engaged in work, you have family relations, you have, it's like, no, no, you, it's like, it's, it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to panic over whether or not you've discovered your higher call and purpose. You have to understand that you have a higher call and purpose that's manifested in the uniqueness of how you've been created in following me. We've overcomplicated this discussion because we've, we've, we've brought it into almost this business plan mindset and this sort of perspective that's like, I have to create sort of this uh, company that's going to achieve this sort of goal. No, actually understanding that you, your life, it's in and of itself without ever building a company has purpose. That you and who you are, the uniqueness of how God's made you is carrying life and wonderful gold that you get to contribute into people's lives. It's time to stop hiding, church. It's, ta- it's time to stop coming into church and sitting in your seats. I was going to say pews, but we don't have pews. Sitting in your seats and then walking out and still questioning whether there's a place for you. Get involved. Find that. Like, engage with people. Volunteer. Find a life group. Do something. If you are str- Does that make sense? There's like these, if, if there's something on your heart, have the conversation. Bring it to a leader. Bring it to, you know what I mean? Like, hey, this is something that's on my life. This is on my heart. This is what I'm passionate about. If you don't know, just find someone that needs help and help them. I, I, you guys, it's, it's actually very simple. If you don't know what to do, find someone that needs help and help them. Why? Because you're bringing, you're supplying your share. You're actually bringing what you carry into those situations. Are you tracking with me? The point, what would be the point? The point moving forward, wow, I'm so, so over time. You guys, holy smokes. The point is this, is that moving forward, we're going we're gonna to have a break, family time, we'll talk about vision stuff. The point is, is that this, the, the, what the purposes of God over this body is directly linked to you understanding your value and your ability to engage and release who you are into the body. Do you understand that there is this beautiful expression of who, who everyone is in this room and the people that aren't here this morning, that there's something beautiful and profound about it. And, 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 and it starts with understanding that you are created for purpose. You're not a mistake. Your personality is not a mistake. That weird laughter that you think gets on people's nerves is not a mistake. Do you understand? Your, 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 your weirdness with certain jokes or, or, or what you call awkwardness is not awkwardness. It's the beauty of how God made you. Are you following me? It's time for us to rise up as a body and engage in that. And you guys already do this so well. So this is like, you understand, like this is not from the context of no one's doing this. This is like casting vision for who we are as we continue to grow. Amen? All right, why don't you guys stand with me? Let's pray. Rescue the children's workers upstairs. Um, and then we'll take like a few minute break and then we'll kind of reconvene. And, and uh, if we stick to the notes, it should be 30, 40 minutes. And then we get out 1230. We eat lunch at 1230, 1245, right? Yeah, that's not bad. Today. It's today. Oh, okay. <laughs> come on, Larry, put your hand on your heart. Ministry team, you guys can come forward. If you want prayer this morning, I want you to come forward. I want you to come get a word. Uh, if you need healing in your body, come. Let's pray for you. Let's lay hands on you. Let's see God do a miracle in your body this morning. All around the room, just close your eyes for just a moment. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. God, and right now, I pray that this room would be pregnant with destiny would be pregnant with identity. God, that the the beauty and the uniqueness of how you've created us and formed us and fashioned us would be released right now over this room, over every heart, over every life, every person struggling with identity. Holy Spirit, right now, we, we pray right now a revelation of the Father's love. Over every person struggling with their place, we pray a revelation, God, of your love right now and, 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 and the, the inroad to being grafted in into the body. Lord, teach us how to do it well. Teach us how to, to, to create an environment where no matter who comes in the door, where they're coming from, that they walk in and there's this place of connection. There's a place of grafting in. 
Lord, that this, that this place, God, we would, as a body, host your presence well. That it would be a center for transformation for this region. Lives and marriages restored. People transformed by your goodness, by your power. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. All right, love you.